Peter 3, verses 8 to 18. Finally, all of you be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another and be compassionate and humble, not paying back evil for evil or insult for insult, but on the contrary, giving a blessing since you were called for this so that you may inherit a blessing. For the one who wants to love life and to see good days, let him keep his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking deceit. And let him turn away from evil and do what is good. Let him seek peace and pursue it, because the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do what is evil. Who then will harm you if you are devoted to what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness, you are blessed. Do not fear what they fear or be intimidated. But in your hearts regard Christ the Lord as holy, ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that when you are accused, those who disparage your good conduct in Christ will be put to shame. For it is better to suffer for doing good if that, should be, if that should be God's will, than for doing evil. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring you to God. He was put to death in the flesh, but made alive by the Spirit. Let's rise and sing hymn number 281. And I don't have a hymnal either. Hymn number 281. BJ, would you open us in prayer? Yes, sir. Father, we thank you for this day, for this time to gather together and to worship you and to fellowship and to study your work. Amen. Lord, we pray as we begin this new study on, uh, on how to defend our faith and how to contend earnestly for the faith that has once for all been delivered unto the saints. Amen. Lord, we pray that you would um, help us uh, to be equipped to be able to give a reasonable answer to those who ask for the hope that is in us. Lord, we pray that uh, that you would teach us to do these things, not just so that we can give an answer, but so that we can know what we believe and why we believe it, and that we can live those truths out. Because, Lord, Amen. we don't just learn the word just to know it, but so that we can live it. And so, Lord, we pray that you would help us with that. Amen. We pray that you would uh, that you would teach us tonight through your spirit, and that you would help us understand these things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, brother. All right. We have finally arrived. Um, looking forward to this. I told BJ I'm going to kind of lean, lean heavily on him in this. He's probably got more experience with apologetics than me. Um, I'll, I'll maybe let him share a little bit about his background. But um, I, I think if you've heard his testimony, he was you know, raised in an unbelieving home. Um, so his, his father, who's still not a believer, will often challenge him in the faith. Why, why do Christians believe what you believe? How could you believe this? And so BJ's got a lot of first-hand experience on defending the faith, um, honestly because he's kind of been forced into it, in a sense. Rather, you have someone like me. I was raised in a believing home, in a believing family. And I don't have, honestly, and this is probably a weakness of mine, I, I don't have a whole lot of experience engaging unbelievers outside of just simple evangelism. You know, it's, it's easy, especially for those of us who are believers, to kind of live in a, a bubble, in a sense, and not interact with unbelievers. Um, especially, right, if you're, not, if you're a pastor of a church and, and you, your only other gig is being a seminarian, right? Like, I, I definitely live... In, in kind of a, a Christian bubble, which is, it's good. Like, I love that, right? Like, I love the fellowship. I love the camaraderie of my church members and of fellow students at school. But I don't get a whole lot of interaction with unbelievers um, unless I'm intentional about it, right? Unless I'm, what's that? Is that right glasses? Right glasses? What's that? Downtown. What's that? When you go downtown, you do. Oh, yeah. Like, 
I got it. I took it. That's what I was thinking of. Unless I intentionally seek them out, and then I get yelled at and called glasses and told to leave. So... <laughs> Yeah, that's about right. And that didn't go so well. So, <laughs> um, But he, he's had much better luck with this than me, so I'm, I'm going to probably lean in, into him a lot. Um, so tonight, just kind of the plan is simple, to talk about what, first off, what apologetics is, secondly, what it isn't, then third, uh, how, how could we go about doing it, and then fourth, to kind of set the stage for what's to come, how do you learn apologetics? And then the last part of the evening, we're just going to take questions from you all. What are some things you would like answered? Right? What, what are some questions you would like answered? So maybe something that uh, a, a child or a grandchild or a family member or a coworker has asked you, right? how could God allow this? Or you know, f- fill in the blank and then we'll field questions. And then the plan is... For the next couple nights, we're going to prepare lessons around answering your questions. So hopefully you have questions, things that are kind of pricking you because that's our goal. So but, so we're going to end with that. But first, we want to talk about what is apologetics, right? According to scripture, what is apologetics? What do you all? You have an defense for why you believe what you believe. Yeah, that's right. That's right. We... we that's why we read from First Peter, opening up, it's right? Not, it's not apologizing for your faith. That's what a lot of people think. Yeah, that's really, it's a weird, a lot of people, why is it called apologetics? It's certainly not. Uh, the, the reason, actually, for the name, um, in First Peter chapter 3, that the passage we just read from, he, Peter tells us, in your, in your hearts, regard Christ the Lord as holy. Then he says, be ready at any time to give a defense to anyone who asks you for the reason, for a reason, for the hope that is in you. Um, the, the word translated answer in English. So, so be ready to give a defense. And I think some translations, maybe the King James says answer. So in the King James, the word translated answer. In the CSB, the word translated defense. In the original Greek, Peter wrote apologia. Be, be ready to give an apologia for your faith. Uh, now, as you probably guessed, that's where our English word apologetics comes from. It comes from the Greek word that is behind 1 Peter 3.15. That's where that comes from. 1 Peter 3.15 in Greek tells us to give an apologia of the faith. An apologia of the faith. Uh, the King James says answer. The CSB says defense. But it all comes from the same word, apologia. So we ask, well, what is an apologia? Well, I, th- I think the translation in the English pretty much answers it. <laughs> a reasonable defense of the hope that is in you to anyone who asks. Um, so apologetics. Uh, we're, we're commanded to be ready to give this defense of what we believe. Uh, I'm kind of reminded of what what Paul tells Timothy. Be ready in season and out of season. I think this is an echo of of what Paul's telling Timothy here. Be ready in season and out of season to to give this answer. Uh, Jude is another another place we can go to in Scripture. uh, BJ just prayed this prayer of Jude. Jude, there is no chapter, it's Jude. (laughs) Jude verse... (laughs) Three, <laughs> he says, dear friends, although I was eager to write you about the salvation we share, I found it necessary to write appealing to you to contend for the faith that was to del- delivered to the saints once for all. So uh, the, the word for contend in Jude is similar to apologia, but slightly different. It's agonizumai, agonizumai, and it's a word that deals with hand to hand combat. Um, Bryce does jujitsu. Right, think of think of that, or uh, my mom did Taekwondo. Right, hand to hand type combat. He's saying, give a defense, contend for the faith. Well, what faith? The faith that was handed down to the saints once and for all from Calvary. Right. So the the story of what Christ did, who man is, who God is. Right. All the stuff we've just spent 18 months talking about in systematic theology, about who God is, what He's done for us, what right? what the Bible says about these things. Contend for it. Be ready to give a reasonable defense of the faith. Uh, a, a perspective on that, I can just jump in 
Absolutely. Uh, a part of that, whenever you're talking to someone and you're sharing the gospel, we, we often look at it like it's an intellectual thing that we're debating with someone, but it's really a spiritual thing, right? Mm-hmm. Our, well, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers of the unseen world. And Paul actually says in 2 Corinthians 10, he says, uh, The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. And so, in a very real way, this is spiritual warfare. Um, and so we need to know what the word says and what we believe because it's actually spiritual warfare that we're engaging in. That's right. Because it engages the mind. That is that's uh, right. the devil's playing field is our mind. So. Yes, that's right. Which, which brings us to another point of what apologetics is. It begins with the Bible. Apologetics must begin with God's word, with scripture. Uh, the, the Bible is the basis, right? As he said, if, if, if the word is sharper than any double-edged sword... If the gospel is what's the power of God unto salvation, then that's what we need to give in apologetics. It needs to be not just Bible-based, but it needs to be the Bible. Um, which there's, there's, uh, it's, it's sort of the same thing with counseling. There's a, a lot of Christian counseling now is adopting kind of worldly, secular approaches to psychology. If, if you're familiar with that. And, and right, I would say we reject that. Right? We go back to the sufficiency of Scripture. Scripture is all we need. So the same, same thing with apologetics. Don't try, try not to get lost in the weeds, giving philosophical arguments and you know the, the latest psychology and the latest science. Don't, don't get lost in the weeds because if you're going right, to... If, if it gets off into science, that's kind of leaving leaving what we're going to be able to probably do real well. Just just stick to the scriptures, right? That's all we have to do. That's all you're called to do. That's all you're called to do. God never asks you to do any more than that. Well, it's a, it's a defense, not an offense. Yes, that's right? a good... Our, our offensive weapon is the gospel, right? That's right. Our, our defense is, this is what I believe, this is what the Bible says, and yeah. then we go on offense with the gospel. That's right, yeah. that's right. Yeah, that's a good way of saying that. It's a defense. Apologetics is a defense, not an offense. Yeah. I like that. Yeah, that's what the Bible says, so that's pretty sound. <laughs> um, yeah, so giving a reasonable defense of the faith, it, it, it is the Bible, right? Don't try not to get wrapped up in philosophical ideologies, stuff like that. And, and as he's, we'll use this as a segue, the goal then, we're still on the first heading, we're on subpoints of the first heading, what is apologetics? Well, the goal of apologetics is to get to the gospel. Right? Anytime you are giving a reasonable defense of your faith, it's picture it like a road that you're driving down, but the destination at the end of the road is the gospel, right? You're, you're trying to get to a point where you can share the gospel with this person. So if they're pushing back on, you know, certain things that Christians might believe or don't believe, right? So, so maybe they're trying to debate you on evolution. Or they're trying to debate you on, well, the flood wasn't global. Or they're trying to... De- What's, yeah, exactly. Don't don't try. I mean, you can answer the questions, right? Like, don't just blow them off. But ultimately, what they need to hear is the gospel. That's what they need to get to, right? Because it's it's a heart issue, and and they're n- never going to understand anything else rightly until they're saved. And what what saves a person? It's not by believing that the flood was global. It's not going to save anybody. The gospel. The gospel is the power of God to salvation. So, so I think we ask, what is apologetics? What well, at the, the base level is kind of recapping this point. Base level, it is giving a reasonable defense. Says Peter, not offense, a defense of the faith. It is scripture, scripture, scripture. Keep it to the Bible because that's what you're defending, right? You're defending the Bible. And faith comes by hearing yes. the word of Christ, right? And it is with the goal. Every apologetic argument is with the goal of getting to the gospel. Here's what you, you need to do to be saved. You need to repent of your sins. You need to place your faith in Christ. That, that's Get to the gospel. Get to that. You may not be able to lead with that. They're, they're going to want their question answered, but you're going to answer it in such a way that you can segue into the gospel as, as quickly as possible. So that's, that's what apologetics is. One last quick thing. Uh, BG and I were talking on the phone this afternoon, kind of outlining this lesson. And he made a really good point 
Um, and I'll, I'll just kind of introduce it. He could take it from there. Um, First Peter three, if you keep reading in context, right? That what what we're we're making as the basis of this study is First Peter three. But whenever we're told to give a defense of our faith, that's only one verse. There's a whole lot of stuff surrounding that verse, isn't there? And it's all on ethical and holy living, right? Be like-minded and sympathetic. Love one another. Be compassionate and humble. Don't pay back evil for evil or insult for insult, right? On the contrary, give a blessing. And he, gets, he goes into some Old Testament allusion there. Then after the command to defend the faith, how does he say to do it? Do it with gentleness. Do it with respect. Keep a clear conscience. Um, he says, uh, it's, it's better to suffer when doing good. So he's, he's giving us all of these ethical charges about how apologetics should be carried out. And, and, and his point on the phone, which I think is 100% accurate, is that the basis of apologetics starts with a holy life. If you aren't living a holy life, it doesn't matter what kind of answer you give. No one's going to listen to you. And, and Peter there is making the argument that the reason that we're giving for the hope that's in us is because someone sees our life and they're asking us about it. And we need to be ready to answer that. That's that's ultimately what he's saying. And, and that yeah, yeah, our, that's our right. Should reflect the gospel we proclaim. So it would look like this. Well, you yeah. I, I, brother, else I, I see you have run your business with integrity for the past 50 years. How have you done this? Why? They're questioning you about that. They've noticed your upright business practices. They've noticed um, right, you're a that you're different in that sense. You're born again. They catch notice of that, and so they're asking you about it. It's we never, we never advertise our business grew on word of mouth. But absolutely, and and in a sense, that's that's kind of what's going to cultivate a good apologetic discussion. Because in 1 Peter 3, the person that is giving a defense of their faith is being questioned because they have been noticed that there is something different about them. There is holy living there. They're bearing fruit that they are a born-again Christian. Right? They're, they're acting with love and compassion and humility. And so people are seeing that. And Peter says, look, if you live this way, people are going to ask you, you know, what's up? And, and he's saying, when they ask, be ready to give a reasonable defense of the hope that is in you. Defend it. Tell them why you're living that holy life. Tell them why, right? Defend it. That's and, that's apologetics. And the way you deliver it, right? He says with compassion. kindness, compassion, and respect. Gentleness, yes. Right? Yep. And a lot of times, I, I, I've seen guys that do apologetics, like, you know, you can watch them on like YouTube and stuff, and they are anything but gentle and compassionate. Um, and, and it's... Yeah. It's it's very cringy because that person there that they're talking to is lost, but you're just pushing them further away because all you're doing is you do a thing getting in a yelling match with them, right? Paul says that we're to always let our uh, how, how does he say it that we're we're to have our words seasoned as with salt. That's right. right? We're to speak the truth with love. Yeah, that's right. So yeah, that, that's how we're supposed to answer those things. That's that's a good word. This is a good segue to our next our next you know, point. The difference between us and that person questioning you is that. I, I would be a saved sinner. Yeah. Would be... God had mercy on, on you. Yeah. Right? It's the mercy just, of God. Just one beggar telling another beggar where he found bread, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. Um, a, a good example of that, just to kind of tie that up, because this is a perfect segue to our next question, what isn't apologetics? Um, I, I, a dear brother in Christ, a student at Midwestern with me, and, and um, I love him, and he loves the Lord. But he, he, he is really into um, a, a kind of apologetics with Mormons in particular. He does a lot of street preaching. He lives in Utah, right? He, he, moved, to, he, le, he moved off the campus and moved to Utah yeah. so that he could witness and evangelize Mormons. And I, I was talking to him one time, and he was invited to debate and defend the faith on a, a public panel, which was then posted on YouTube. And everything that he said about the Christian faith was right. And yet in conversation, he told me, I went, when I went back and I watched myself in that debate, I realized I lost because I let my emotions get the best of me. He said, I, I got angry. I raised my voice. I acted 
without respect to the, the Mormons that he was engaging in that panel. And so he's been very aware of that moving forward. It's, it's not as much what he says, because everything he said about the Christian faith was 100% true. It was how he said it, right? It was how he said it. And, and I only tell you that story because he, he confessed that, and I, I don't think he would have any problem with me sharing that. Um, so the question is, so what is apologetics? It's giving a reasonable defense, defense, not offense, defense of the faith. It should spring out of holy living. The goal of it is to get to the gospel. It's a means to the end, and it begins and ends with the Bible. It is not, don't get wrapped up in philosophical ideology. So what isn't apologetics? What is it not? Well, I think the first thing we've established is it's not a debate, right? If someone begins to challenge you on your faith, the, the, the goal of, of everything we're going to do over the next month or two, we're not trying to put a bunch of swords in your hand so that when someone tries to engage you in the faith, you pull out the sword and you just stab them to death, right? That's not, that's not what we're trying to do. We're not, it's not a debate. Um, and, and that's something, gosh, I have to be careful of because I love a good, now I'm going to confess, I love it. BJ will tell you, I love a good debate. I, I, I and he eggs me on. He did that the other night. It's like midnight on a Friday, and we're on speakerphone, and he's trying to debate me on the number of ordinances in the church. You know, I say there's two, <laughs> baptism and communion. He goes, well, what if there's six? And he played devil's advocate for the next half hour. It's like, bro, it's midnight. <laughs> My brain's not working that way. Let me go to bed. But it's, I love a good debate. I'm a sucker for a good debate. And that's where we have to be really careful. It's one thing to have fun debating the faith with a brother or a sister in the faith, right? In good spirit. But what you don't want to do is turn a conversation with a lost person and, and debate them just for the sake of winning, right? This is not so that we can win a debate. That's not the purpose of what we're about to do. And neither is it knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's, it's not about one-upping them or to show how much we know or how smart we are. The next thing it's not, it's not evangelism. Apologetics is not evangelism. It can be a part of evangelism. Indeed, it can be a tool. It could be a vehicle to get you to the gospel. But again, you're not going to save someone by trying to convince them that the flood was global. It doesn't matter how many good factoids from Ken Ham that we can put in their hand. If, if they, you don't get to the gospel, you can do anything, right? Um you, you, the, the point is this, you won't argue someone into heaven, no matter how great of a debater you are, no matter how many good factoids we have to argue that there really was a King David, right? That Jesus really was crucified, that there is absolutely no remains because he ascended to heaven, right? It doesn't matter how many good facts we can give to prove the authenticity of the faith. You will never argue someone into heaven. Can't happen. We're not the Holy Spirit. <laughs> well, the, 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 whole, the whole reason for that is when you talk to a lost person, their problem is not mainly intellectual. They have a heart issue, right? And the only thing that can change the heart is the gospel. That's right. And, and so just having an intellectual debate with someone isn't going to fix their problem. They need a new heart. And the That's only way right. they're going to get that is to come to Jesus, right? That's the only way they're going to get a new heart. That's is, right. Is, is with the gospel. So. That's right. That's that's a work of the Holy Spirit. Right. That's a work of the Holy Spirit. It's not it's not a work of head knowledge, which is why you can have people go off to seminary and be completely and totally lost and get their masters of divinity or their doctorate in ministry, and and they can sit under. Eight, nine years of solid Bible academia and come out of that and still be lost. We go, well, this shouldn't be. Well, I mean, what's the point of academia? The point of academia is to target the, the brain. But the way to get saved is to they need a new heart. So that's that's so it's so all that said, that's what apologetics is, and that's what it's not. So then it begs the question, how do you do apologetics? Why is, well, let me ask this, why is it important then? If, if that's not going to save people, if you can't argue people into heaven, why does Peter tell us? 
that we need to be able to give a reasonable defense of the faith. Why does Peter tell us that? Why does Jude tell us to contend for the faith that was delivered to the saints once for all from Calvary? Why does Paul tell Timothy to be ready in season and out of season? If, 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 if that act in and of itself will not save someone, so why, why is it important then? I mean, we're told that multiple times in Scripture that we need to understand this so we can pull it out on a whim if we're ever pushed, right? To be on the fence. Why? Why is that important? Got to get to the gospel. Yeah, I, I think that's... Yeah. You got to agree to disagree sometimes. I think that's largely it, a, a vehicle to get to the gospel. You're kind of dispelling... Um, maybe, maybe you look at it like there's a lot of trash in the road. Right? You're trying to get to the gospel. I've used that illustration. There's gospels at the end of the road, but apologetics is kind of clearing the trash out of the road, right? Cleaning the debris out of the way, make it, making way to get to where you're going. Um, I, I definitely, I, I, I think I, I don't think it. I know it, right? The Bible says there's a place for this. Right, so in God's providence, he's going to use it somehow, some way. Right, there is a place for this. It's important to give a defense of the faith. To get to the gospel, to clear the trash out of the road, what be it, God in his providence through Peter and Paul and um, Jude have told us that there is a place for this. If you do it with humility, they see a difference in you and how the world would react to them when they disagree with them about stuff. That's right. Yeah, I, I, think, I think that's a lot of it. Well, it's, it's like um, in well, at the beginning of First Peter three, how, there's there's he's talking to women who have unbelieving husbands, and how does he tell them that they're going to win them over mm. by their quiet submission and their humility? Yeah. Right? It, it's by their character. We just preached on this. Not, not necessarily <laughs> their words, and so uh, I think I think our attitude and the way we deliver that is just as important, if not more important, than being able to answer all of their questions. That's right. Yep, that's right. Um, yeah, and I think ultimately it comes down to... Um, no, actually, I'm not going to add anything to that. I think it pretty well says it. I'm going to let that lie. Um, so I guess the last question for discussion's sake then is, is how do you learn apologetics? How do you learn apologetics? What's the best way? If, if we know what it is, we know what it's not, and we know how to go about it, how then can we learn apologetics? Let's practice. Trial and error. Trial and error, practice. And what was that, Sharon? <laughs> learn the word. Learn the word. That's right. That's the, and, and, and Rachel and Ellis, y'all are 100% absolutely right. Um, Sh Sharon gave the answer that we had on the outline. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, to study the word, right? To know the word. The best way to be ready to give a defense of the word in season and out of season is to know the word. Uh, I think I used the illustration a couple Sundays ago. My desire is to be a person that said of me that if you cut me, I bleed Bible, like it was said of Spurgeon. Right? That's the only way you get that way, though, is to consume the word in such a high quantity that it just kind of spills out of you. Right? Know the word. That's the best way to prepare for apologetics. Well, know the word. The, the example that I always use, and that's actually Joel put on the paper, is. Is Jessica when she worked when she started working at the bank, and they were teaching her about counterfeit money. They didn't bring her all the different counterfeit bills and make her study them. They gave her the one true, real one hundred dollar bill, and you learn all of the details of it, what it feels like, and all of that. So when a fake one comes by, you notice it immediately, and that's really, I guess, what we're kind of trying to say is, the the best way to learn how to defend your faith is to know what you believe, to know what the word says, and then when a fake. That's right. Religion comes by, or when someone says something, you catch it immediately because you recognize that it's not real. That's right. Yeah, that's that's a, that's about the most succinct way you can say that. I, I once heard a pastor say, and I can't remember who it was. He was uh, talking about the the release of of some some of the newer contemporary Christian music that came out. He said, you know, it, it's kind of hard to say what what is a sound worship song from what's a, what's not because a lot of it's so subjective, right, to preference. He said, but yet. At the same time, there is this sense that everyone can say, that is a gospel-saturated, Christ-exalting song. And I don't think anybody can maybe put their finger on it. It's just, when you hear it, you know. 
right? That's going to be a timeless song used in the worship of God. And, and there's no formula, I think, that spells it out. But I, I think that comes from, when you know, you know. I think that comes from studying what good worship is, right? From being immersed in the Word. From being exposed to these things. Because when you study it, you see it over and over and over again. When something comes along that's counterfeit, you're instantly going to go, ah, that's not right. Something just isn't jiving about that. Um, so yeah, the, the best way to do apologetics is to study the Word, to know the Word. And, I, and the reason we put that in here is because there is a, a contemporary idea about apologetics that we do it by going out and studying other movements. Go out and study what they believe so that we can engage them on their ground. But again, that's not what the Bible is asking us to do. That's almost offensive, actually. Yeah. yeah we're, we're not engaging them on their ground. That's not our fight. That's not our worry. Right? All we are called to do is to give a reasonable defense of the, the hope in who? Our God. You, right? In, in our God. Now, that's, that's not to say that we shouldn't go places where unbelievers are, right? Like, we should go to college campuses and engage those people with the gospel. And we know the questions are going to come up when that happens. Yes. But that's where we need to know what we believe and yeah. how to use that to get to the gospel. And, yeah, and even that, even then, I, example, uh, one of our visits to the homeless community in Savannah, a person had um, tried to ask my question about some super weird conspiracy theory. He told me he was in, like, the secret forces and, like, the government was trying. That's what... Um, I don't know. It was wild, man. Like cell phone rays were like brainwashing the people and trying to get us into doing this stuff. I, it was odd. And, um, and he was wanting to ask, like, ask me to pray with him about that. And like, I was like, well, let's talk a little more about this. But the whole point of the conversation was to get things back within our realm of orthodoxy. I wasn't about to try to engage that. <laughs> right. I wanted to give a defense of the faith that we have. That's it. <laughs> that's it. There's, we went to them, right? Like BJ said, that's not to say that you don't go to these places. But in conversation, you want to get it back on your grounds. We're on the defense, not the offense. Your, your goal in going there is, is to share the gospel with them. That's not, right. Not to just debate with them about what they believe. That's right. So that said, any other thoughts on that? We, we've covered what it is, right? what, what it is, giving a reasonable defense of the faith, it should come about. Uh, questions should. It, it's it's with with a holy life, holy living. Um, you have to have that. It's an end to get. It's a means to get to the gospel. It begins with the Bible and ends with the Bible. We avoid philosophical debates. That's what it is. What it isn't. It's not debate. It's not knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's not evangelism. It's not. The gospel, though it certainly can be used with presenting it, and it will not argue someone is the king to heaven. How do you do it? You do it to get people to the gospel. You do it with humility. You do it with compassion. You do it defensively, not offensively. And how do you learn it? Study the word. Study the word. Um, so that's kind of our, our main questions. I guess real quick, we have a few minutes before we get to the, the op open discussion on this. Um, one example that uh, we came up with this afternoon where you see apologetics being used in Scripture would be in Acts chapter 17. In Acts chapter 17, Paul is in the Areopagus. He's there on Mars Hill. And he addresses them. In verse 22, he says, People of Athens, I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed to an unknown God. Therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it, he is Lord of heaven and earth. He does not live in shrines made by hands, neither is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. Since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man, he has made every nationality to live over the whole earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live. He did this so that they might seek God and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and have our being, as even some of your own poets have said, 
for we are also his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent, because he has set up a day when he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. Paul is doing apologetics there. That is a prime, most apologists, most Christian apologists love Acts chapter 17 because that is a prime example of how an apostle of Jesus Christ would have done apologetics. He, he starts by addressing the people of Athens, right? He's, he's conversation is on their turf. And this is the perfect example, right? I see you're very religious. You've even got this altar to an unknown God, right? He's meeting them on their, their ground there. And he steers that conversation back to the God who made the heaven and the earth. He, he polemically uses that against the fact that he doesn't live in their shrines. And he, he continues to talk to them. And look what he does. He lands on the gospel. It's perfect. He starts, about, he, he starts this conversation talking about the, the altar to an unknown God and, and complimenting their religiosity as he kind of gently condemns them for it. And he, by the end of this discourse, he's saying what? God commands all people everywhere to repent. So he begins, that's apologetics, that's how it's meant to be done. And he lands it with a gospel invitation. That's a prime example. And, and to point out too, Paul didn't go out of his way to find these people. If you read just a few verses back, he went to the synagogue, which was his normal custom, and he was preaching to the people in the synagogue. And these Epicurean poets and these philosophers heard him and said, what is this bad we're talking about? Let's bring him and see yeah. what he says. So they invited Paul to come and do this. And that's why he's doing it. He didn't just walk up on them and just start blasting their religion. Yeah. Because uh, if he would have just walked up on him, he probably would have just shared the gospel. For sure. But they, they asked him about the hope that was in him, and so... He gave a defense. He gave a, <laughs> he gave a defense. So if you ever wonder what Peter meant in 1 Peter 3, you can see it played out in Acts 17. That's a good example of what apologetics is. So that all said, uh, what we're going to try to do over the next month or two, depending how many questions we have, is try to address common questions or challenges that we might get as Christians and kind of give you the tools to address them, to give a defense. What, and, what, and show you how to get to the gospel from them. Yes, and show you how to get to the gospel from those questions. So that said, what are some things that y'all might have, have, have been asked that maybe you've struggled with or maybe you've, you've answered but you feel like maybe you could have done a better job getting to the gospel um, or maybe just some stuff you've heard in the news that common ones, you know, evolution, global flood, right? These are all, but is, is there something specifically? That's a big one. That's a big one. Yes. Big one. That's a big one. Yes. Theodicy. Is, yeah. The, the fancy word for that's theodicy. It's reconciling the existence of a good God who is in control. How can that exist in the face of evil? And they think things that he did evil. Yes. Yes. That's a big one. That's a big one. That'll probably be our first lesson next week. Yep. Yeah. Well, that's like, um, I wish the Dianes were here tonight. Which Diane was it that said she had a friend who, when Biden was elected president, left the faith? So how, how could God allow, was her question. And my, my gut reaction is, read, if you think he's bad, read what they had to deal with in the first century church. <laughs> my goodness, they were putting them to death. They had Nero. He was using Christians as torches to light the city. Yeah. When God creates something and gives it free will, that opens the door. Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's probably going to be a lot of the basis of these, these, these answers. Um, yeah, so how, how could he, such evil exist? But honestly, I mean, I, I think that's a fair question when people ask. You know, when we talk about abortion, right, even though we've overturned Roe v. Wade for, 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 for decades, we were killing 3,000 babies a day. How, 
that's a, that's a legit, I think you can have a person who's genuinely trying to wrestle with faith going, man, how can that happen if there's a good God who's in control? I think that's a fair question to ask. And so that's, that's a good one. We need to be able to give an answer on that. More, more people starve to death today, died from starvation than any other sickness or any other disease in the world. Yeah. So what's something else y'all have been asked? We'll be another, that's, that'll probably be a whole lesson all in itself. Um, what's another one that y'all would, would like to like for us to talk about? You raise your hand, Jess? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So how, how would you urge a question? How do you know the Bible is the Word of God? or How can you trust it? How can you trust the Bible? Yeah. Yeah. For y'all who can't hear up front, her question was uh, the, the question she gets a lot is how can we trust the Bible if it's been translated so many times and has so many contradictions? It's a good question. Just in my Bible reading today in 1 Kings 4 or 5, there is a number that contradicts um, the number of, of D King Solomon uh, had. 1 Kings said King Solomon had 3,600 deputies dispatched for the building of the first temple. Second Chronicles, in that accounting, says like 3,300 deputies. So people will take these apparent discrepancies and use them yeah, to contradict. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's another fair question. You also got to understand, too, that the Bible was written by humans. Sure. It was inspired, it was an inspired word of God. And different people, even in the disciples, perceived different things when Jesus was taught teaching them. Yes. So it has you have to take into account yep. the person that was writing the scripture. That's right. No, you're you're hundred percent right. God worked through human personalities to get the written word. Yes. Mark writes nothing like John. Mm -hmm. And yet both the word of God. But God, God preserved the personalities in their writing. And, and that's a lot of it. It's like an eyewitness. You have four people watching and seeing an accident. But every one of them is going to tell you yeah. things that's a little bit different about that accident. That's right. They might order it slightly different in how they tell it for, for one reason or another. And that's, um, that's the way, you know, it's divinely inspired. And he selected the people that wrote it. It doesn't matter about the translations. Well, God's not inspiring those people that saw the accident. Mm -mm. No, she, she's but, just using an example of, the, of how four different people can see things differently. But the disciples were 12 different people, and they see different things according to Jesus' teaching. That's right. But by having that many people do it, it gives us a broader idea as to what for sure well and not only that but they're writing to different crowds right matthew is writing to a largely jewish crowd and luke he's writing to a gentile right to most excellent theophilus so he's going to draw out different stuff to make a different point because he's addressing a much different he's background putting, he's putting different emphasis on stuff that's right so that's a lot of it too culture. that's right so yeah that's right that's a lot of it. those are two good questions those will be two great lessons right there um, is there anything else? Is there any other questions y'all have been asked that would be a good one to have a lesson on? I know another one that people would ask too. They think all God's point to the same God. All religions point to the same God. That's a good one too. Or, or, aren't, aren't we all worshiping? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yep. That's kind of like the universalist idea. Mm -hmm. it's very, very, that's very common now, very, very common. Worshiping. What else? Rachel Ellis, William, Miss Nancy? I don't know if this is enough for a whole lesson, but um, more recently there's been people who say like the God of the Bible is evil. That like with this only stuff in the Old Testament, like he commands uh, like God commands to to kill a bunch of people, all the women and children and everything. Mm. Yeah, that's very close to what Sharon's question was. Yeah. Should I just put that as a supplement? We'll just see. Well, it wouldn't probably hurt to let uh, the Dianes all 
have a chance to throw some questions in too. So we'll have to see how many questions we get. Right now we got four weeks, four lessons worth. So that's pretty good. So hopefully we can get to a survey of Hebrews after this. So we weren't wanting to do a whole lot in this, but um, that's good. I mean, if y'all think of something, you can text me or message me or let me know or let BJ know and we'll get it on the on the itinerary. We won't be able to have a, a lesson the fifth Sunday this month because that's our, our fifth Sunday potluck. So, um, so that's a good start. So just kind of recapping, and then that'll be it. We're coming up on eight anyway. Um, if God can do anything, can he make a rock so big he can't lift it? <laughs> oh, what do y'all think? <laughs> <laughs> that's like the, um, goodness, that's like what the, uh, how bad the seminaries had gotten. The 1500s, you know, the ubiquitous question they were teaching in all the seminaries in the Middle Ages, how many angels can dance on the head of a pen? Oh, yeah. They were, it's like, who cares? <laughs> <laughs> Is God evil for killing people in the Bible? Okay. I, I, when he told when he told the Israelites to go kill all the Canaanites. Yeah. Yep. Or when God struck Ananias and Sapphira dead, is that yeah. make God evil? Yeah. 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 Yep. <laughs> by, agree. by the way, uh, the question that I just asked is um, is a question that doesn't make sense. There's not really an answer to it. Uh, the the truth is, is that God can't do anything, right? God can't learn, He can't grow, He can't that's die. That's a good point. So the question doesn't even make sense. That's a good point. And God doesn't operate outside of reality, and reality is, is He's the most powerful being, so He can't make sense. He is right. reality. How does He operate outside of Himself? Yeah. He right. can't. I made that point this morning in the sermon. Right. Worshiping is not improving upon God when you ascribe honor to Him, because you can't approve upon that which is already perfect. That's right. It's literally impossible. And, and God, it's like God mind can't, blowing. God can't make a square triangle, right? That's yeah. It's impossible because it does, <laughs> it's outside of the realm of reality. That's right. God is a God of order. First Corinthians fourteen, right? right? <laughs> Logic and reason. Not a God of chaos. Hundred percent. So, just kind of a brief recap, and then we'll close out in prayer. Um, apologetics is giving a reasonable defense of the faith. Uh, it should come out of holy living, causing other people to take notice of our holy lives. Um, it is a vehicle to get to the gospel. It is a means to an end with the gospel at the end. And it begins with and is solidly rooted in scripture. It is giving a defense of what we believe, which comes from what? The Bible. So we should use the Bible. What isn't apologetics, it's not a debate. It's not knowledge for knowledge sake. It's not evangelism. And it's not the gospel. Thus, it will not argue someone of the kingdom of heaven. How do you do apologetics? Humbly, with compassion, gentleness, patience, realizing that what you're, you're sharing with that person, what they really need is a heart change. And how do you learn apologetics? The best way to learn it is to not go out and study a bunch of false religions, but to study the one true religion. Know the word. Um, last quick illustration, I, I guess. This just came to my mind. I left this out. It was on the outline. I didn't mention it. On the how do you do it, um, this is why we have to be careful that we don't just completely let ourselves get into an all-out debate with someone when we're giving a defense of the faith. So someone asks you, if God is good, why does evil exist? And you, you give them a good answer, right? You give them a good answer on that. Guess what they could do? They'll probably counter, and they'll ask you another question. You give them another good answer. And guess what they're going to do? They're probably going to counter. <laughs> right? You could go on with this all night long and just talk in circles with them. John 3 talks about, he said, what, why does Jesus say <clears throat> people don't believe? Because they love their sin. Their deeds were evil. They loved the darkness. So if you, if you run into a dark room and it's filled with people who love the darkness and you start shining a flashlight around, it doesn't matter how bright of a light you have. They're going to find the one corner where there's no light, and that's where they're going to cower. They're going to hide from the light. So that's why it has to get to the gospel. Now, it's not to say, don't, I'm not saying don't run in the room and shine the light. By all means, do it. Right? The Bible says to do these things, to contend for the faith, to give a reasonable defense. Shine the light in the room. But know that when you do, they're going to find that one shred of evidence that appears to be contrary to what you're saying. And they're going to use it against you. Instead of trying to find the 
truth of it, they're trying. To they're it. exactly. They will they will look for every shred of opposing evidence they can find and they use it against the because their deeds were evil and they love the darkness. So that's where they're gonna hide. I, I, I got to the point when we were doing uh, street evangelism in Charlotte. I used to do a street evangelism ministry there. I got to the point that when I would talk to someone and they would say they were an atheist. I would ask them point blank and say, if I give you evidence and proof that God exists, that the Bible is true, and that Jesus rose from the dead, will you believe? And if they would say no, I'd say, all right, here's a gospel track, have a good day. Yeah. And I was done. That's right. Because I knew that, I just said, if I give you all of the answers for all of these things, will yeah. you believe? And they said no. And like I said in a sermon a few weeks ago, if, if, if so many people say, if God would just speak to me, I would believe. And I'm telling you, if God's hand could fall from the, you know, a physical hand could come from the sky and give them a holy hand slap, they would write up some weird scientific theory that made a hand fall from the sky and fall atop their head, Maybe rather than just there. believing. Yeah, that's right. Others believing, right? That's they 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 love the darkness. Uh, that's or that's they where they're going to be. A false god that went with that. <laughs> Make an idol of it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that's that's what we're up against. So it's important to remember we battle not against. Principalities and powers, but I flipped that, didn't I? <laughs> you know the verse. <laughs> it's getting late and my brain's getting tired. <laughs> this is why BJ doesn't need to debate me at midnight, because I flip things in my head. Um, so that's all very important to remember. It's not to say it's not important, but it's just to put what we're about to do into context. So I hope it's helpful, and I hope it will give you some answers for some common questions that you might be asked that will help you when you are asked. But you're not giving these answers to win. You have to use the gospel for that. That's what they need ultimately. So any other thoughts? Any other questions? We'll take the first lesson, uh, Ms. Sharon's question. I think we'll take it first next week. We'll ask the question, if God is good, why does evil exist? And we'll try to give you an answer from Scripture about what Scripture says about that. So that'll be our task. <laughs> if... Uh, no other thoughts? Would you close us out, brother, in prayer? Yep. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for uh, this night and this uh, opportunity that we have to come together and to learn these things about your word, Lord, to be able to give that reasonable defense of our faith to those who ask. Lord, we pray that, um, that as we go throughout this, this week, Lord, we pray that you would put someone in our pathway that we would be able to share the gospel with them. Amen. Lord, we pray that, um, that as we go through this uh, series, this study over the next couple of months, Lord, that you would help us and equip us to, to learn how to be good defenders of the faith. Yes. Uh, Lord, that people who, who live right and who share the gospel with the right attitude and, and, and speak out of love for others. Um, and Lord, that, that we would be able to give these answers, but we would be able to do it with the goal of getting to the gospel. Amen. Lord, we pray that we would see fruit from our labors. And we pray that through all of it, Lord, your name would be glorified. Yes. And we ask this in Jesus' name.